So welcome everyone, delighted to have you all with us. My name is Katie Cannon. I'm the Curator of Education at the DAR Museum. And with me, um, I have John Reese, who's going to be our uh, speaker for today. So this is part of our Tuesday talk lecture series that is on the second Tuesday of every month, usually. Uh, we, at noon, we have a, um, uh, a, a lecture either from a curator at the DAR Museum or from a, a guest. So I uh, hope you'll, if you enjoy this one, I hope you will check us out for future events as well. So uh, John Reese is a lifelong resident of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He's been writing about common soldiers' experiences in the war for American independence for over 30 years on the subjects ranging from women with the army, food and the soldiers' burden, to army wagons and watercraft, campaign shelters, and Continental Army conscription. He has authored over 150 articles and one book entitled, They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783. And that is also the topic of today's talk. Um, it's really good to be here and I really appreciate uh, Katie giving me the in invitation. Um, I just want to, uh, in a relatively short time, um, I want to give some idea of African Americans experiences as Continental Army soldiers. Along the way, I'll share the stories of several individuals, um, take a look at how so color, soldiers of color were treated and tie it all together with some insights into their numbers. I'll close by reading a portion of the only known still existing letter written by a revolutionary black soldier to his wife. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, before I go into the main portion of my talk, I wanna mention two of the three largely all black regiments that served in the War of the Revolution. I'll speak of the third, this segregated American First Rhode Island Regiment later. And I must say that um, these are all black regiments. By and large, the Continental Army was a segregated organization as was the American militia. The earliest was the Loyalist Ethiopian Regiment formed in 1775 with freed slaves, mostly from, mostly from Virginia by rural governor, John Murray Earl of Dunmore. That unit was, was disbanded after one year. Six months later in March, 1777, British commander in chief Sir William Howe directed that all Negroes, mulattoes and other improper persons who have been admitted into Loyalist Corps be immediately discharged. In March, 1779, French, the French military formed the Chasseur Volontaire de Saint-Domingue, formed in what later became known as Haiti. The regiment was formed of both free and slave were promised their freedom in return for military service. Their first action was at the siege of British-held Savannah, Georgia in autumn 1779, and it was disbanded in 1783. Now back to the Continental Army. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When those words were written for the Declaration of Independence, Africans had been enslaved in the British North America for almost 160 years, and African Americans had been fighting 14 months for the cause of American independence in the Continental Army and States Militia. Not for another 89 years would slavery in the United States be legally ended. At the onset of the war for independence, approximately 500,000 African Americans lived in the colonies, of whom some 450,000 were enslaved. Blacks fought in provincial regiments prior to the war and roughly 5,000 African-American soldiers and sailors, free and slave, served the revolutionary cause. While accurate numbers are hard to come by, the American population at the time was approximately some 2.1 million. Using those accepted estimates, free blacks comprised 2.4% of the population, while slaves formed 21.5%. Before we go on, let's discuss black soldiers' motivation for joining the Continental Army. The reasons largely mirrored those of their fellow white and Indian soldiers. And I mentioned Indian soldiers because the service of, service of Indians and African-Americans uh, is largely intertwined, even though there were few, fewer uh, Native Americans uh, in the army. Many of the men fought for national independence and hoped for opportunities in the new country. Some, perhaps many, joined for the adventure of military service, Some kinds, sometimes connected to the prospect of serving alongside family or friends. Others were at least partly enticed by the lure of enlistment bounty or regular pay. 
forced service was another factor. If they were on the militia rolls, both white and black men periodically faced the chance of being drafted for a short-term stint in a Continental Regiment. Whites were occasionally compelled to enlist, but enslaved African-Americans were more often coerced or forced by their masters to serve. Some were promised freedom in return, but most of these, promise, most of these promise, promises were honored, but a few were kept in bondage. Of course, the major, major dividing line be, between white and black common soldiers was the American system that enslaved 90% of the country's African-American population. Now let's turn to an overview of early service. Black Americans were in the fight from the first. Massachusetts militia men of color, free and enslaved, fought alongside the white comrades on April 19, 1775. To date, we have the names of 35 black men present that day, at least 18 seen in combat. One, Prince Estabrook was wounded with Captain John Parker's company on Lexington Green. It's unlikely, or it's likely that as many as 40 to 50 African Americans were with the militia on that war's first day. Two months later, at least 88 black and 15 Indian soldiers are known to have served at the Bunker Hill battle. One historian estimates the total may have, may have been as high as 150, roughly 5% 5, 5 of American troops involved. There are several mentions of black participation in the early, those early actions, but this is my favorite. Speaking to the courage and resilience of African American soldiers in the effect one man's determination had on another. John Greenwood, a white soldier, noted of that day Everywhere, the greatest terror and confusion seemed to prevail. As I ran along the road leading to Barker Hill, it was filled with chairs and wagons bearing the wounded and dead. Never having beheld such a sight before, I felt very much frightened. I could positively feel my hair stand on end. Just as I came near the place, a Negro man, wounded in the back of his neck, passed me, and the car being open, and he not having anything on except his shirt and trousers. I saw the wound quite plainly and the blood running down his back. I asked him if it hurt much. He said no, that he was only going to put a, get a plaster put on it, and meant to return. He could not conceive what encouragement this immediately gave me. I began to feel brave and like a soldier from that moment, and fear never troubled me afterward during the whole war. Despite their proven ability, African Americans were early on deemed unfit for continental service. A May 1775 Massachusetts Provincial Resolution stated that no slaves be admitted into this army upon any consideration whatever. By contrast, an October 1775 Council of Officers agreed unanimously to reject all slaves and by a great majority to reject Negroes altogether, while November 12 Army orders directed neither Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, nor old, man, old men unfit unfit to endure the fatigues of the campaign are to be enlisted. Signaling a change of policy at the end of December, General George Washington to told of numbers of free Negroes who were desirous of enlisting, giving leave to the recruiting armed officers to entertain them. Given the desperate need to fill Continental regiments, that was soon amended to include all free Blacks, and the American Army began as and remained a racially integrated organization to the war's end. But despite the inclusion and acceptance of African Americans in the ranks and little to no indication of animus from white soldiers, black Continentals were generally allowed only to serve as musicians or privates, and at least in their early war years, may have been channeled into laboring duties more often than their white comrades. That said, black musket bearing soldiers fought in every major battle of the war and in most, if not all of the lesser actions. A number of American officers and congressmen noted the fact of African Americans in the ranks, some un unfavorably with the claim they were unsuited to be soldiers but positive remarks were in the majority. In response to John Adams' October 1775 question about black soldiers in the Massachusetts regiments, Adams called them unsuitable for service. General William Heath replied, there are in the Massachusetts regiments some few lads and old men and in several regiments, some Negroes. Such is also the case with the regiments from, uh, from the other colonies. Rhode Island has a number of Negroes and Indians. Connecticut has fewer Negroes, but a number of Indians. The New Hampshire regiments have less of both. The men from Connecticut, I think, in general, are rather stouter than those of either of the other colonies. But the troops of our colony are robust, agile, and as fine fellows in general as they would ever wish to see in the field. General John Thomas was more emphatic. In the regiments at Roxbury, Massachusetts, the privates are equal to any that I served with last war. Very few old men, and in the ranks, very few boys. Negroes on them in general equally serviceable with other men for fatigue and action. Many of them have proved themselves brave. Foreign officers were also complimentary. In December, 1777, a German officer wrote of the American Revolutionary Forces, the Negro can take the field in his master's place. Hence, you never see a regiment in which there are not a lot of Negroes and there are well-built, strong, husky fellows among them. 
And Baron Ludwig von Klosen, aide de camp to French General Rochambeau, wrote in July 1781. And this is actually a very remarkable quote, uh, just for what it says about the army, um, to say the least about, uh, about African American soldiers. He wrote, I had a chance to see the American army man for man. It is really painful to see those brave men almost naked with only some trousers and little linen jackets, most of them without stockings. But would you believe it? Very cheerful and healthy in appearance. It is incredible that soldiers are composed of men of every age, even children of 15, of whites and blacks, unpaid and rather poorly fed, can march so fast and withstand fire so steadfastly. As for numbers, uh, close and claimed, a quarter of Washington's army were Negroes, merry, confident, and sturdy. Now, regarding his estimate of numbers, uh, my research indicates that while the proportion of Black Continentals likely increased in the later war years, in 1781, they were more likely 8 to 10 percent of the army rather than 25 percent. Now, let's take a little bit of a look at numbers. Um, here we have the August uh, 1778 uh, return of 15 brigades in Washington's main army. Um, and it's return of the number of African-American soldiers in those 15 brigades. There were 755 African-Americans and its force totaling almost 18,000 rank and file. So that means sergeants, corporals, music, and private soldiers, making them 4.2% of the whole. Now, while that proportion seems rather small, by themselves, soldiers of color would, would form two understrength regiments, each equal to or larger in size than most other serving continental regiments. And additionally, let's recall that free blacks form 2.4% of the overall American population. So even considering the numbers of slaves who served, free African-Americans were well represented as regards military service. New Jersey and Rhode Island were the, were the only states not represented in the return that had units serving the North Washington's army. The number of blacks serving in New Jersey's four continental regiments is uncertain, but like in the entire war, Rhode Island had just reconstituted one of its regiments, the first filling it with African-American Indian private soldiers, mostly former slaves. In August, 1778, that unit contained 147 privates. Adding those men would make an approximate total of African-American soldiers that month to, about, to around 916. So we can play a bit. Uh, actually, we, we, we can gain some more insights from this um, by playing with percentages in the brigades. So here are the six, high, six brigades with the highest percentages. And you can see that uh, they're much or they're larger than the 4.2% of, of the whole of those 15 brigades. And in those highest uh, six um, brigades, you have three uh, Northern brigades and three Southern brigades. So that speaks to the, um, to the large numbers of African-American soldiers in Southern brigades too. Uh, Parsons, Connecticut had 9.3%. Uh, Muhlensburg, Virginia had 8.5% and North Carolina Brigade has 6.5%. Um, so you can see Southern Brigades are in, are in the, uh, the you know, two of the three highest uh, brigades. Um, playing a little bit more, uh, we can figure out um, how many soldiers at, on average were with, uh, in uh, each regiment of each brigade. Um, and there were eight companies per regiment. So you can, you can divide those numbers by eight and, and get an idea of how many uh, African-Americans were, uh, were in uh, each company unless they were all, they were all uh, clumped together in other companies. Again, you have um, you know, three, southern, uh, three southern brigades and three uh, northern brigades. Uh, Parsons, Connecticut had an average of 37 black soldiers, North Carolina, 29 black soldiers, and Patterson's, Massachusetts, uh, 22 black soldiers uh, per regiment. So here we have a modern image of a single company of Henley's additional regiment in 1779. It's a good representation of how many continental companies would have appeared with some having a few more black soldiers and others none at all. As I noted before, the proportion of African-American soldiers may be considered rather small, but that's not as important as their mere presence in mixed regiments. One reason is the equation of military service with citizenship, a concept that continued into the mid 19th century. More importantly, foreign observers and others likely consider African-Americans serving alongside white soldiers as a radical revolutionary statement, almost on a par with the Declaration of Independence and taking up arms against the King's army. It had been an unintentional and to some an unwelcome political statement, but it was just as powerful as the purposeful and just as pragmatic army of blacks during the 1860s American Civil War. So from numbers, let's turn to two individual soldier stories. 
These come from veterans uh, 19th century pension uh, narratives um, and those pension applications numbered in the thousands. Uh, historian John C. Dan called it uh, one of the largest oral, oral history projects ever undertaken. Jacob Francis was born in New Jersey and eventually served in a Massachusetts Continental Regiment for one year, and then in the New Jersey militia from 1777 to the war's end. Francis was born in January 1754 and testified, when I was of age, I was bound as an indentured servant, not a slave, but an indentured servant, by my mother, a colored woman, to one Henry Wambell in Amwell, New Jersey. His indenture was sold to three other masters and eventually at a little over 13 years of age to Joseph Saxton, who took him to New York, then to an island in the Caribbean, and then back to Salem, Massachusetts. Where he was sold till I was 21 years of age. So still living in, in Seattle, Massachusetts, uh, Jacob Francis enlisted in autumn 1775 for one year in Sergeant's 16th Continental, Reg Continental Regiment, and that regiment uh, belonged to Massachusetts. During that term, he served at the Boston Siege and witnessed the battles of Long Island and White Plains. A short time after the fall of Fort Lee on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, Francis and his comrades marched across New Jersey, crossed the river into Pennsylvania, and then marched down to a camp off from the Delaware River. And this is, this is what he said, off from the Delaware River, a few miles present day New Hope, Pennsylvania, and above House Ferry, where we lay, we lay there a week or two. In his pension, pension application, uh, Jacob quite accurately described the uh, 26th December 70, 1776 attack on the Hessians at Trenton. Um, he wrote, we just received orders to march and Christmas night crossed the Delaware River down to Trenton early in the morning. We entered the west end of the town. General Washington came into the north end of the town. We marched down the street from the river road into the town to the corner where it crosses the street running out towards the Scotch Road and turned up that street. General Washington was at the head of that street coming down towards us, and some of the Hessians were between us. There we had the fight, and the principal firing was. After about half an hour, the firing ceased. General Lord Sterling rode up to Colonel Sargent, and we were ordered to follow him down through the town towards Assenpink Creek and crossed onto the north side of it. We were formed in line in view of the Hessians who were paraded on the south side. Being hemmed in, the Hessians surrendered, grounded their arms, and left them there and marched down to the old ferry below the Assenpink Creek where they referred to the Pennsylvania side of the, of the Delaware. And actually Francis was, uh, was involved as a ferryman on that operation. Private Francis soon ended his Continental Army career being discharged to Trenton soon after the battle. The remainder of Francis's lengthy deposition recounts his militia career too long to recount here, but he did state, I always went out when it came to my turn to the end of the war and went out once as a substitute for a person who could not and gave me $45 Continental money to take his place. A side note, in 1789, Jacob Francis struck another small blow for freedom. Former slave Phyllis Duncan testified, she was present and saw Mary Francis married to Jacob Francis by Cato Finley. At the time of the marriage, Phyllis and Francis, Francis, Mary Francis and Cato Finley all lived with and were the slaves of Nathaniel Hunt, where the marriage took place. Jacob Francis immediately after his marriage bought Mary off her master Nathaniel Hunt. Mary in a few days left the employ of Hunt and went with her husband and have ever since that time lived together as man and wife up until the death of Jacob and raised a family of children. Uh, Francis, this is one of the more remarkable depositions. Um, of all the black Virginia continental, continentals found from my study, Andrew Pebbles had perhaps, perhaps the most varied career. In his pension testimony, Pebbles recall, noted he didn't recall the year he enlisted being a poor unlearned mulatto, but according to his military records, it was September 15, 1777. Uh, he testified in his pension. He joined the camp at Valley Forge and was placed under the command of Captain Lewis Booker, 11th Virginia Regiment, for two years. At Trenton, he served one year in the artillery. He was under Captain William Miller, 1st Continental Artil Artillery Regiment, who commanded the gun with 12 men to which he belonged. He served for two years under Captain Michael Rudolph of Maryland in the light infantry commanded by Colonel Harry Lee. That's uh, late horse Harry Lee or Henry Lee, who was the father of Robert E. Lee. Um, Lee's command was composed of infantry and cavalry and was called Lee's Legion. He was in three general actions at Monmouth, Guilford Courthouse, and at Utah Springs. At Utah Springs, he received three wounds. He was wounded in the shoulder slightly, lost the thumb of the left hand, and was bayoneted in the belly. He was discharged on Combahee River, South Carolina, honorably. 
The day before he was discharged, he was in a battle in which General Colonel John Lawrence, who commanded in the absence of Colonel Lee, was killed. On that was 27 August uh, 1782. Uh, People too, though a free man had to deal with the issue of slavery post-war and his pension testified, by occupation, I'm a miller from the infirmities of old age increased by the wounds received in the Revolutionary War, I'm not able to render much service to my employer. I am a free mulatto. My wife and child who live at the mill where I do are slaves. My wife's name is Rachel, aged between 15 and 60 years and my child's name is Ursula, aged 11 years. Uh, several other Virginia veterans told of enslaved family members when they applied for pensions in the early 19th century. Um, Thomas Mahorny was a planter on a little farm, not his, and was rendered, rendered unable to pursue it by reason that was age and infirmity. His family resided with him are as follows, his wife Mama and his son Jack, both of which are slaves. He being a free man of color who slaved in the war of the revolution and is unassisted by the labor of his family. Drury Scott noted my occupation is that of a rough carpenter, but I can get but little work. And I, if I had more, I could not do it. My wife is all my family, but being a slave can render me no assistance. So now let's turn to the first, the segregated first Rhode Island Regiment. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the uh, black soldiers of the first Rhode Island Regiment as they would have looked in 1777. And that was before it was segregated and 1778 after it was segregated. The unit most associated with African-American revolutionary soldiers is the so-called Black First Rhode Island Regiment. In reality, it, list, it existed as such only from March 1778 to June 1780, two years and three months. It never was large enough to form a full regiment and because of that never served with Washington's main army until after the unit joined the second Rhode Island in 1781, when they were consolidated to form the, the uh, single Rhode Island Regiment. Well, a detailed discussion would take much too much time. Several aspects of the Rhode Island Regiments before and soon after the regiment uh, are in order. Little is certainly known of African American numbers in 1775, in the 1775 and 76 uh, Rhode Island Regiments. But Massachusetts General William Heath's 1775 letter noted, the regiments of Rhode Island have a number of Negroes and Indians. All of the Rhode Island regiments from 1775 through 77 contained black soldiers serving alongside their white comrades. In other words, in other words, in other words they were integrated regiments. With the Continental Army's 1777 rebirth, only the first and second Rhode Island regiments remained, recruited with men enlisted or re-enlisted for three years or, or, or the, for the duration of the war. The Rhode Island reg regiments were particularly hard hit during the 1777 campaign, and the state had to consider how to recruit them. General James Varnum rec recommended in January 1778 that a battalion of Negroes be raised in Rhode Island. That February, the state legislature resolved that any Negro, mulatto, or Indian man slave in this state may enlist into either of the two battalions to serve during the continuance of the war. And again, the service of African and uh, African Americans and uh, Indians are, are hand in hand. It was eventually determined that these recruits would join only the first Rhode Island regiments and that, and that that unit would contain only black or Native American privates with white commissioned officers, sergeants and corporals. And it must be noted that while there were Native Americans in the, first, in the segregated Rhode Island regiment, uh, there were, they were in the minority. Um, Governor Nicholas Cook noted in late February, the number of slaves in this state is not great, but it is generally thought that 300 and upwards will be enlisted. Any slaves accepted? received the freedom and their owners were remunerated. Unpopular with many residents in early May, the legislature set a June 10, 1778 cutoff date for slave recruiting, the free blacks could continue to enlist. Despite Governor Cook's assurances, at best less than 150 African Americans ever joined the first regiment and it was never able to form a full battalion for, uh, in the field. Now, while the first, the first Rhode Island command staff was recruiting uh, slaves in their home state, the regiment's enlisted personnel remaining at Valley Forge were incorporated into the second regiment. At the same time, but, but not all of them, as you will see. At the same time, the veteran black soldiers from both regiments were formed into a single, single segregated company under Captain Thomas Arnold. Arnold's large company, uh, 60 privates by spring 1778, belonged to the absent 1st Regiment, but while with the main army fielded with Colonel Israel Angle's 2nd Rhode Island. 
And actually here we have uh, a little known incident. Um, many people still don't know about it. Uh, it's actually the, the uh, include um, the service of a, uh, a segregated black company uh, at the Battle of Monmouth. When Washington's forces confronted the British at the June 28, 1778 Battle of Monmouth, Captain Arnold's black company marched to Monmouth Courthouse with Varner's brigade and Major General Charles Lee's advance force. Early in the action, Lee's men retreated in the face of superior forces, withdrawing towards Washington's marching troops. Meeting the main army's van, General Lee encountered Washington, who placed Lee in charge of an ad hoc holding action. Lieutenant Colonel Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Olney described the Royal Island troops during the ensuing defense. And this is a, is at a site, it's at a site called the Hedgerow um, or Hedge Fence. Uh, if you go to Monmouth Field, Battlefield today, and I highly, highly recommend that because it, it's actually a, an amazing place. Um, you can go to the site of the Hedgerow uh, defensive action. After retiring something more than a mile, General Varnum's brigade was ordered to halt and formed by a cross fence to cover two pieces of artillery, which were in danger of being lost. We there exchanged about 10 rounds and were then obliged to retire with considerable loss, but not until, not until the en enemy had outflanked us and advanced with charge bayonets to the fence by which we had formed. Our brigade suffered more than any that was engaged the enemy did not pursue us far in our retreat, observing our army formed on the heights in our rear. Um, Captain Arnold's leg was amputated as a result of his wound in the action, and one of Arnold's men, Richard Rhodes, related in the 19th century, he's very much crippled in one arm in consequence of a wound received in the Battle of Monmouth. He was born in Africa, brought to this country, and sold as a slave, and enlisted in the Black Regiment to obtain his freedom. Arnold's company joined the first Rhode Island in 17, July 1778, home state actually. Um, the so-called Black Regiment went on to see combat at the August 1778 Battle of Rhode Island and remained in her home state until marching into New York to be consolidated with second Rhode Island in uh, early 1781. Now, I, I just wanna take a moment to dis discuss the treatment of African-American soldiers uh, in the army. At the most basic level, Continental Army, Army soldiers of color, both African and Native Americans, received the same pay, provisions, clothing, and equipment as white soldiers. They suffered together in, in times of scarcity and jointly enjoy, enjoyed the rare times of bounty. Were there difficulties due to officers or fellow soldiers with personal or racial, racial animus? Most surely, but to my knowledge, such instant instances were few and far between. Um, and I just want to compare this to uh, the United States colored regiments in the American Civil War, uh, the, the black soldiers then were paid less than the white soldiers uh, and was a, a source of, of much contention. Now, one incident is telling, and here we remain with the Rhode Island troops. A white Rhode Island soldier, Abner, Abner Simmons, recalled in 1780 uh, when the two remaining black companies, black regiment companies were joined with an understrength and integrated Rhode Island six months levy regiment. Um, Simmons said, Captain Elijah Lewis capta, uh, commanded the Black Company, um, actually two companies, which took post on the right of the Levy Regiment. It must be noted that the right of the regiment was a place of honor, and in this case, case it was accorded to two segregated Black companies. So with the 1778 Army return in mind, um, when the percentage of the whole 15 brigades was 4.2%, and I think the highest brigade percentage was about 9.3%. Uh, let's look briefly at the Rhode Island African American soldiers from uh, numbers from 1777 to 1781. In October 1777, just after the hard fought, hard fought Battle of Red Bank, the two Rhode Island regiments contained 369 musicians and privates, including 65 African American soldiers. At that time, black soldiers amounted to 17.5% of rank and file strength larger than any proportion or brigade proportion on the 1778 army return. In August, 1778, the regiment contained 137 black soldiers uh, plus five Indians and four with mixed Indian African American blood, uh, which at that, who at that time were called Mustis. By, by, September, 70, 17, 70, by September 1779, it had, had 170, 147 black so, uh, soldiers of color, I mean soldiers of color, in June 1780, with only 124 Black and Indian soldiers, the unit was formed into two large companies and attached to an understrength Rhode Island six-month levy, uh, levy battalion. And by September 1781, in a return taken uh, when they were at Head of Elk, Maryland on their way to uh, the Yorktown siege, um, the 
two black companies remained uh, segregate, segregated in the Rhode Island Regiment, and they numbered 108 private soldiers. Um, adding black musicians and soldiers on other duty at that date, black soldiers comprised 29% of the regiment. Um, so you can see that they, the, the percentage then was, was actually a lot higher, at least three times higher than the largest brigade on the 1778 army return. So before we move on a bit more about this uh, unit, uh, the segregated First Rhode Island Regiment was an outlier, an experiment born of a necessity in an army of integrated units. The experiment was largely un unsuccessful, but through no fault of its own. The fact that the regiment remained seriously under strength for the entire term of its, of its existence was largely due to the legislature cutting off slave enlistment only four months after it was begun. Still, in the 19th century, the Black Regiment became a symbol and an example of African-American ability as soldiers and was seen by many as a precursor to the United States. Colored regiments, the United States colored regiments that were formed during our Civil War. Next, while, we've seen how, while we have seen how slavery could affect free blacks after the war, let's see how, how even serving soldiers were not immune to that threat. A late war soldiers of, soldiers of the Indian confrontation emphasizes the perils black soldiers were exposed to, even from their white revolutionaries. Private Fortune Stoddard began his military career with the integrated Rhode Island 1780 six month state battalion. Re-enlisting in the 1781 Rhode Island Regiment that December after the Yorktown siege, he and a number of Rhode Island soldiers were, were, soldiers were quartered on the first floor of a home at Head of Elk, Maryland. Upstairs, a group of seamen were celebrating. And James Cunningham descended to the first floor and commenced abusing the soldiers, particularly Stoddard, who he assaulted with his fists and a small round chair. Private Stoddard called on the captain to cease. At that point, Connecticut Captain Ebenezer Wales entered and confronted Cap uh, Cunningham, who in turn threatened Wales, who then had the seamen ousted at the point of the bayonet. Cunningham and his men returned the next day and demanded alcohol from the homeowner, which he refused. The sound of breaking furniture drew two unarmed Rhode Island soldiers, uh, Rhode Islanders upstairs. One was knocked to the floor and Benjamin Blanchard, a white private, retreated downstairs. So here from, from this uh, account, we can see that uh, the white soldiers and black soldiers were all serving, uh, living in the same house. When the seamen followed him down, the rest of the soldiers were readied with loaded muskets and fixed bayonets. One white private aimed at Captain Cunningham's chest, but a seaman seized the weapon from the soldier, upon which the captain grabbed it and struck the soldier's head. At this, Private Stoddard fired, hitting Cunningham in the groin, a wound that proved mortal. So as you can see, Cunningham, Cunningham's was, was an aggravate, aggravated assault, uh, and Stoddard fired in self-defense. Fortune Stoddard was arrested and tried for murder in a Cecil County, Maryland civil court. He was eventually convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to be branded, specifically burnt in the brawn of the left thumb with a hot iron. That being done, Stoddard was still required to pay court costs, but not having the funds to do so, he remained confined. Finally, the court, county government settled on the solution that he be sold into slavery to pay his debt. This was a free African-American um, being sold into slavery for a debt. Fortunately, the Rhode Island commander brought the case to General Washington's attention, and eight months after the incident, the Continental Congress uh, decided, that, decided that the state of Maryland be requested to, dis to discharge from confinement Fortune Stoddard, a soldier belonging to the Rhode Island Regiment, confined for costs accrued in the late prosecution, and charged such costs to the United States in order that the same may be charged to the said soldier and deducted out of his pay. Now, a similar case occurred, occurred, occurred in April 1781. Uh, Rhode Island Private Prince Green was on nighttime guard duty in Providence when he spotted and challenged someone near his post. Calling for the person to halt and not being complied with, Green fired and killed 23-year-old Edward Allen. Green was arrested by civil authorities and charged with murder. The death of a citizen at the hands of soldier humble in uh, Providence, but that the soldier was black and his victim weight would likely have added to the uproar. Um, still, the trial, trial was, was, uh, was fair. Uh, it was held in county court four days after the shooting and Prince Green was convicted of manslaughter instead of murder. Um, his sentence was to receive an M-shaped brand on his hand and to pay all court costs. Um, in Green's case, uh, either he or somebody else was able to pay the court costs and he soon returned to his regiment and served to the, to the end of the war. Now in Stoddard's case, he never reappeared on the regiment's muster rolls and was likely confined to the war's end. He did eventually return to Rhode Island and lived in Newport. 
where he married, raised a family, and by 1805 was working as a chimney sweep. Um, that both Greens and Stoddard's murder, murder charges resulted in manslaughter convictions uh, that did not require confinement speaks to some fairness in the jury's deliberations, despite, despite the then common but to us barbaric sentence of branding. The most telling and horrifying result is the Cecil County government's suggestion that Fortune Stoddard be sold into slavery to pay the owed court costs. Beyond, beyond any other opinions on the matter, no white soldier could be subjected to the same solution. Um, I now want to speak of the African American women who, uh, by their own free will or the will of others, served with the army. To correct the popular idea of army women, black and white, they were by and large respectable and respected. Any women who were not were not long tolerated. I discovered a number of black women with the army, some of them servants. One of those was Hannah Till, who served as General Washington in General Washington's household and gave birth to a son at Valley Forge. Another was Rachel, a slave who stole herself and joined the First Maryland Regiment in 1778. But I want to focus on one woman, Judith Lines, and read a portion of the only known surviving letter written home by a black soldier during the war, published for the first time in my book, uh, They Were Good Soldiers. To the letter, uh, John Lines enlisted in the 5th Connecticut Regiment in March 1781 for three years. Part of his time was spent at West Point and other Hudson Highland posts. By Judith Lines' own testimony, they married in 1780. She recalled the next summer, 1781, after I married, he sent for me to come to him. I think the place was called the Highlands. At that time, my husband was a waiter for Colonel Sherman. And while at the camp, I had the smallpox. I think I stayed about three or four months. Mrs. Lyons noted in a pension, pension application, my husband used to write to me when he was in the army and I have one of his letters now and which I give to the magistrate who takes this my deposition. It is dated November 11, 1781 and is in the handwriting of my husband. So we can tell from, uh, from these, this testimony that uh, Number one, Judith Lyons was with her husband in the army for a short period. Um, while there, she contracted smallpox, which is uh, no mean disease uh, to recover from. Um, and it's very likely she had scars on her face as a result. And also her husband could write. Um, now, there were a lot of white soldiers who, who, couldn't, uh, who couldn't write. And that's, you can tell that be like, uh, by looking at their uh, pension depositions um, and when they, uh, they had to write an X or another mark instead of their name. Um, so now, uh, John Lyons' letter to Judith. I take this opportunity to send to you my dear and loving wife to let you know that I am well and hoping these lines may find you and the children well. This is the sixth letter of mine and I haven't received one. I belong to Colonel Sherman's regiment, Captain Rice's company, we lay at Fishkill now. I should be very glad if you would send me a letter how you've lived this summer and whether the house is done and whether you kill that cow or whether you have got, a, got another. I want to know the, all these things very much. I, I intend to come home this winter if I can, but don't, don't know if I can. If I could see you myself, then I could talk with you, my dear wife, as I like. I've seen hard times. I have lived 11 days with bread only. I remain your loving husband until death, John Lines. Now, from this letter, you can see that Judith, Judith Lyons was back home uh, trying to keep uh, uh, life, limb, and property uh, um, uh, going. And I know from, uh, from other te pension testimony that uh, Judith Lyons actually had, uh, I think, two children. So she, she, she had at least two children at home. Now, coming near the end of my presentation, um, I just want to say that, that Lines and other veterans returned home to a changed and changing nation. Despite the waning of Northern slavery with the ratif ratif ratification of the 1789 United States Constitution and boosted by the 1794 cotton gin patent, black bondage was cemented as a political and economic fact and detrimental weight racial attitudes hardened before, but more especially after 1800. 35 years after the war, black revolutionary veterans along with their white uh, comrades were eligible for service pensions. But even in that systems, system, they sometimes, not always, but sometimes experienced the effect of increasing bias. When all was said and done, African-American military service was a direct challenge to slavery and the racial construct and, a, and, a front, and an affront to many white citizens. Still, black Americans continued to fight for their nation as 81-year-old Judith Lines related in 1837. 
My youngest son died of a wound received in the last war, the War of 1812. His name was Benjamin. The wound was, was received at the Battle of Chippewa, July 5, 1814. And Black Revolutionary veterans remained proud of their service. Um, and this was attested by, our, by a veteran, Artillo Freeman. Uh, in, in the pension depositions, after the first Pension Act, um, the veterans had to show that they were, they were in need. Uh, so they, they had to give a list of their belongings and then there was a value given to, to, uh, to that. So when Arturo Freeman uh, did that, uh, gave a tally of his belongings, um, he the whole was totaled at $15.75. Uh, at the end of the list, he added one more item, uh, quote, revolutionary uniform, invaluable, unquote. And in closing, uh, former Private Henry Hallowell, Colonel Rufus Putnam's 5th Massachusetts Regiment, uh, and Hallowell was a white soldier, gave this simple but fitting tribute to the African-American soldiers, free and slave, who served the revolutionary cause in a number of roles. He wrote, in my company, there, were, there was four Negroes named Jephthah Ward, Job Upton, Douglas Middleton, and Palm Simmons. Part of them called on me after their time was out. So that ends my talk. Um, I just want to uh, further say that there, there is some more information. Um, I have a, uh, some information online and if you have any questions at all, um, you can uh, send, me, send them via uh, email. Um, I thank you so, thank you very much and uh, have a good day.